I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalian. And first of all, I want to say a big thank you to our Visionary Voyager sponsor, Big Red M. They are the go-to association growth partners offering consulting, sales, research, and now publishing services to, yes, their support helps make this podcast and the upcoming Association Chat Road Trip to ASE Annual possible. So thank you for that. Joining us today is Jeff DeCanya, a thought leader in the association community, a friend, a mentor, and he is going to discuss his series, The Three Stewardship Imperatives of Fit for Purpose Association Boards. We talk about this orthodoxy and uh, you talk a lot about orthodoxy, about, about trying to fight um, orthodoxy and habit and thought, right? And so why is thinking and acting beyond orthodoxy so critical to fit for purpose board work? Yeah, so in, in the context of this imperative, you know, and, and each, if everyone reads the articles, they'll see that I've connected each one of these imperatives to uh, two, I have six core convictions, I have six habits of mind. So I've tied them to two of each of those, right? And so one of those, well, really two of those that are related is the importance of intentional learning. That's one of the, have the core convictions. And then the habit of mind is thinking and acting beyond orthodoxy because orthodox beliefs, just let's define, are the deep-seated assumptions we make about how the world works. So in this case, um, the worlds that we're talking about are the worlds of boards, the worlds of associations, the worlds of uh, of governing, the worlds of, of everything that goes into this, what this discussion is about the worlds of their industries and professions, everything is included, <clears throat> excuse me. And there's orthodoxy in all of that, right? Orthodoxy is, there's no limit. There's no shortage of orthodoxy um, in our um, in our worlds, uh, in our society, in our organizations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the reason why we have to be thinking and acting beyond orthodoxy, especially with regard to this imperative intention is responsibility is when we talk, I mentioned earlier, attention is responsibility means a, a lot of focus, concentration on the part of boards on the learning process, on the process of making sense of the challenges before their organizations, making meaning around them to facilitate their decision making, and then repeating that and doing it over and over again. That's really what fit for purpose board work centers on is how do we do this learning so we can make better decisions to shape a different future to leave it better than how we found that's the core, you know, core to, to stewardship. If you are operating on the basis of orthodoxy, uh, on the basis of assumptions about how the world works, it diminishes your incentive for learning and it distracts your attention toward the past, toward believing that orthodoxy instead of gathering new information, instead of doing new learning. And orthodoxy, since it's invisible to us, and so deeply embedded in the way that our organizations work and the way that we've built our structures and, and you know, everything that we do, uh, you know, it, it, it is a barrier to that learning and it distracts us from being able to, um, you know, really pursue that work with the full intention that we need. And so it undermines the responsibility of boards when boards give in to al allow the orthodoxy to um, shape their decision making, then they are, you know, in a sense, I think you could argue that they're, they're, they're bringing a, a measure of irresponsibility to the decision making process because they're grounding their choices in a world that no longer exists on mm -hmm. the basis of beliefs that are no longer helpful and were per perhaps once true, but may no longer be true. And we can't even really evaluate whether they were true when they were first created, when they first became <laughs> part of the way the organization functions. So, uh, you know, I'm doing a, I'm, I'll mention now I'm doing a webinar for association forum on, on July 10th on questioning the orthodox beliefs of association uh, governing. Uh, and I'm actually running a poll now on, on, uh, on LinkedIn to try to gather information on, on four different orthodox beliefs of boards uh, or around boards and governing and associations that I hope people will respond to. I'm happy to, you know, share a link and, and people can, you know, put their, their thoughts in, but you know, those four orthodox beliefs that are listed there are, you know, association governing must be based on a political or governmental model. Um, association boards are leadership groups, uh, association board, association service is a volunteer role. 
and that association boards should drive uh, the work of strategy. And those mm -hmm. are just four of the orthodox beliefs um, that are that I will talk about in this webinar and that are listed in this poll. But you know there are many others, and yeah. so and, th and those are just the ones related to boards and governing specifically. There are so many other orthodox beliefs. So the fit for purpose board is always going to challenge the orthodoxy because they're going to recognize how it distracts their attention, how it undermines their decision making, and how it interferes with their ability to be to bring full responsibility to the task that they have before them. I never thought when I first started talking about orthodoxy years ago that I would devote so much attention to it. But now in in this 23rd year of my work, I, I now regard it as one of the principal threats wow. to wow. the future of our organizations because we're so stuck in that orthodoxy and it creates complacency um, and it undermines you know, what it is we need to be accomplishing, what boards need to be focusing on as we look toward the rest of this decade and beyond. Well, you know, and we have, I'm gonna have to dig out of the, uh, out of the archives of association chat. You and I had a discussion about, about when you first started talking about that too. And so, you know, to see where things are now with it, which is like, no, it's a big threat. It's a bigger threat than even I realized at the time. Like it's, it's like yeah, um, yeah. a primary threat. And so, yeah. Um, you talk about the second imperative being adaptation as renewal. Why is that important to association boards? So I mentioned earlier, you know, that uh, I, I really, for me, the, the, the pandemic and everything that fell on it was kind of a, a reckoning. And the reckoning for me was understanding that what I had tried to do, I think, before the beginning of this decade before we went through that was encourage associations and their boards to think of themselves as kind of the nonprofit versions of some of the biggest technology companies um, or the biggest businesses in, in this country and around the world. And what I realized as a result of the pandemic was that we need to be who we are, not become a um, a, uh, a less effective, less resourced version of somebody else. Right. And so the task for us, in my view, we, we have to face the reality of disruption in our environment. But our task, in my view, is not to figure out how to um, invest our, our resources in a transformation you know, process, but rather to have a, a smarter way of approaching how we're going to prepare for the future, which is to really think about how we adapt ourselves mm -hmm. to the forces that are happening. And we'll talk about anticipation in a moment, and that goes hand in hand with it. And then to really think about this in terms of renewing what is great about what an association is oh, in this environment, yes. right? Yes. And yeah. and renewing about, you know, the idea that we are about relationship building, we're about collaboration, we're about helping people um, unite and bring solidarity to the issues, um, to explore, you know, collaborative, collective and collaborative decision making. The, the very history of associations dating back to their founding, their beginning, um, in the 18th century, in the 19th century in the United States, it was all about, you know, helping people do things together they couldn't do themselves. They were about human well-being. And on that basis alone, uh, on the basis of in 2024, we need organizations and, and 21st century societal institutions to be focused on human well-being. Um, I think that's who we should be, right? And so mm -hmm. for me, it's about renewing who we are, renewing purpose, renewing our fundamental reasons for being. And to also move this conversation, even though I don't explicitly write about this in this particular column, I write about it elsewhere, but to move this, this really dead end conversation we've been having for a very long time about relevance and, and, right. and perhaps move away from that because it's not helping. And yet we keep, we keep talking about it. And to really think about you know a, a more robust conversation around how we renew ourselves for you know for what we have been historically but in the best possible way so that we can be important contributors to what happens next in right. our society in a, in a world of low trust in institutions of questionable legitimacy <laughs> in institutions adaptation yeah. is renewal is the imperative of stewardship that guides us away from trying to become something that we're not and yeah. instead become the best possible version 
of what we have always been and to and it, and it helps boards leave their organizations better than how they found it which consistently is the stewardship responsibility that i encourage them um, to take and to be thinking about their successors right in important ways yeah i mean i there are so many things that you said just in that that bit that is is really speaking directly to me because I mean, I look at it and I think are a lot of the rules, a lot of the um, the longstanding institutions that we have in our society, a lot of the things that people looked at as sort of touchstones for what they could believe in, what they could trust, um, have fallen, or at least they have faced a lot of disruption in the in the past. We have associations who are over here that um, these associations stand at their very best as being able to be these sources of truth, of credibility, of, um, you know, an excellent way to curate relationships, to cultivate relationships. And I do, I look at the history and I think of, of, do we still have a need for associations? Absolutely. We do. Absolutely. And I mean, more now, like I, I, I want to say more now than ever, because we've always, I think, needed them. But like, there is a reason they exist. There's a reason they're here. Um, when we get so focused, you know, and I say we as associations, like the association industry, when we get so focused on trying to be something we're not and, and trying to like, how, what would we be if we were more entrepreneurial? What would we look like if we were more like Amazon or something like that? It's like, well, what would we be if we are the best version of, of what we're supposed to be here, like of this association? And um, Michael Tatinetti is someone that he said uh, something recently that I thought was really, really important, which is we talk a lot about non-dues revenue, and that's important. And I don't want, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, but he said, I think that maybe we're making a mistake by not focusing more on dues revenue. Like, what are we providing as a value to the members? And like, what what we are as, as an association just by itself, like why somebody's belonging and paying their membership dues to start with. And so um, it's an interesting question. And I hear a lot of people, I, I was just in a discussion about it yesterday with some other podcasters and um, just looking at this idea, a lot of uh, associations that one particular person is working with, we're talking about this um, falling away of members, uh, member numbers. And so questions about like, why, why are they, why are they falling away? Is it the industry? Is it change? Is it that they're not seeing the value um, in, you know, membership, paying their membership dues at all? And, um, and it's just an, it's a fascinating discussion, but I do think that associations have such an important role to play. And I do look at, at the trust that they have with their members the upholding that and um, cultivating those relationships and really doubling down on what we're supposed to be good at as associations is the way to go. Um, so anyway, sorry, thank you for, <laughs> this is, this is uh, not an interview of me, this is an interview for you, but like, um, thanks for letting me go down that path a little bit, um, indulging me. 